So hello, everybody. Um, this is uh, John Coburn Evans and Matthew Emerson. This is our sixth podcast in our leadership series. And today, particularly, we're going to focus on the cultural side and the soft side of mergers and acquisitions, something that we've both been heavily involved in, actually also from both a coaching and a consulting perspective, and some of the hard stuff. But we thought the, the soft side of it, the cultural side, was particularly important because sometimes that gets forgotten into, in, in any M&A activity. So um, before I go on into any detail, I'm going to bring Matthew in here to talk about some of the, the macro challenges that are, are faced in a, a huge merger, a merger and acquisition. So over to you, um, Matthew. Thanks, John. Yeah. So as we as we discussed, we, we're kind of looking at this from a few different angles. And I think specifically when we think about mergers and acquisitions, there's there's the angle of the acquiring company that, that usually the entity obviously is making a purchase, wanting to make sure that everything they've done around due diligence and the build up to to acquiring and integration is fruitful uh, and that they've got the right amount of data and information to aid a transition to whatever the new sort of working world is in that uh, post-acquisition land. Um, there's also the angle of the acquired company that you know typically again if we think about an acquisition there's the the seller uh, and i guess the organization that comes with that wanting to make sure um that from that point of view the efficacy of the business and so-called sort of crown jewels what they've developed over possibly years and the value within that business um is going to remain intact or, or kind of be respected as part of that um that transition and then you've got the sort of blended perspective which is you know these merging organizations you want to make sure that integration follows some agreed principles can be managed at the right pace and with a level of perceived fairness and parity not not to be uh, uh, always about sort of we we've acquired you've been acquired and, and therefore sort of almost master servant-esque but actually uh, embracing kind of the value that's uh, been seen in both organizations and trying to, to trying to maximize that um, for the future. So we kind of, when we spoke about this previously, we sort of laid that out as being the sort of broad context. Uh, and I think, John, you, you then were able to sort of dig into some of the specific cultural elements, as you say, that a lot of our expertise is more specifically in this cultural area. Uh, so just run us through, John, the cultural elements, um, as you see them as being really a key to making effective mergers or, or acquisitions. Yes, thank you, Matthew. Uh, just a, a quick rewind. I think I mentioned in the intro that I talked about huge mergers. Obviously, mergers can scale from you know anything from you know uh, five to ten million up to to billions. And I think the key thing here is we must remember is that the, the principles apply. Um, obviously, there'll be a level below which the mergers will become quite simplistic. Anyway, so thanks for the leading on that one. So yeah, culture is the foundation of business performance. You know, it impacts every aspect of work. It includes creativity, innovation, employee engagement, and collaboration, and obviously productivity and effectiveness. You know, in large multinational companies, it may be determined by history, regional cultural variations, and long-term stewardship. I personally have seen that in, in areas such as the Middle East and Eastern Europe. In smaller companies, it can be determined by leadership, team makeup, start point, business demographic, et cetera. All of these should be fairly obvious when we think about them, but quite often we don't always think about them as deeply as we should do. And getting the appropriate culture to support the business aims can be difficult. Um, culture can be both an enabler and a derailer, and it's worthwhile remembering that as well. But I think sometimes, you know, when we get caught up in the euphoria of a, a merger, and an acquisition that we forget, you know, there can be some potential downsides if we don't manage it right. Um, and I guess one final point here is culture really is a, a collective behavioral norm. It's der derived from shared values and is important to those shared values with the company ambition and goals. And again, that's something that's really important and any team that's involved in an M&A or similar activity shouldn't forget that. So at, at that point, Matthew, I'm gonna hand over to you to talk more specifically and a bit more deeply about the, the four stages of M&A, particularly as we see it and with our collective experience. Yeah, thanks, John. I think that that point you made at the end there about kind of uh, collect, you know, collective behaviour, behavioural norms and, and shared values, I think 
when you when you're thinking about the four stages of any mer merger acquisition, um, I guess in in my mind anyway, at least you're starting from a a slightly more disparate position and trying to bring obviously two businesses and, and therefore two organizations, two teams together. Um, so I think that is kind of the, as you say, the sort of foundational element to this. Um, just just to go through the four stages then. So we're, obviously there's a due diligence phase. I think most people who've uh, had any experience of um, M&A, you know, understand due diligence from the perspective of perhaps uh, legal financial due diligence, really trying to get the facts of the business um, documented and understood um, to either you know, value, put a valuation on that uh, to evaluate it or to uh, understand any potential kind of future risks um, embedded within that. So I guess from our point of view, we were uh, looking at the due diligence, due diligence uh, stage as being an area where you also then need to start to understand um, the people, the organization and the dynamics and the cultural DNA um, of the organizations being acquired for exactly the same reasons, making sure you've understood the value uh, therein uh, and also identified any potential risks with that. The second point then is more the transaction focus. So the second stage being really about the point of acquiring and merging, which in technical terms may be a sort of transaction, single point in time uh, type of piece, but actually you know, leading up to and for a short period of time afterwards, I think there's still a lot of focus around that transaction. I think keeping both uh, critical leaders and critical people uh, within the organization engaged is important, but also uh, making sure you're paying attention to uh, perhaps, as I said, cultural DNA, cultural attributes and whether or not they're being harnessed or, or potentially eroded as part of that um, process. The third stage then being more immediately post acquisition, thinking about key priorities, uh, short term results, maybe quick wins, finding a way of uh, getting some positive momentum into that process uh, where people feel part of it uh, to the extent that uh, it's, a, it's a positive experience and that there's some uh, intent around, as I said, harnessing some of the key components of the organization. And really then creating the basis, and I used the word momentum before, really creating a, a basis from which you can start to think about the medium and long term and, and making sure that the gains intended from a merger or acquisition can be sustained. So there, the, that sort of fourth stage, medium, long term focus, building out from some of the quick wins, but actually looking at why, why did we do this uh, transaction in the first place? What are we hoping to achieve? And using uh, an understanding of the organization and its culture and then, and then an integrated uh, organization and perhaps a slightly new culture um, to drive some of those gains. So there's, there's in our minds, those four stages. I think what I referred to at the beginning, the, the due diligence piece in all of my experience has often been consumed by what I'd call sort of the hard facts, uh, fact finding, the, the uh, say legal, financial, maybe broader sort of commercial due diligence, um, per perhaps a bit less on what we, we might call organizational or cultural due diligence. So John, uh, back, back to you, could you just talk us through more specifically on that due diligence stage uh, and explain a bit about what we're, what we're thinking about there? Yeah, absolutely, Matthew. I think just before I, I, I do that, I'd just like to come back to your point about the criticality of the four stages. I think, um, I think as you said, the DD process can get very focused on the more transactional elements. That's why it's really important that we, people do recognize that there are four stages of an M&A um, and we, you, know, you get to the point of, as you say, medium long-term and sustainability in a very, very effective way. Because sometimes I think these things can get a bit muddied. So I think that's, you know, those points you made are really, really important. So if we go on to the DD process itself, and, and although we're doing a short podcast today and we can't cover everything, we thought it was right to talk about the DD process in a bit of detail, because that's really at the front end. And it's like anything else. If you set up the front end right, you've got a greater chance of making sure the middle and the back end are, are going to work effectively as well. But of course, that's not necessarily the case so you know far too many times the dd process is focused entirely on more tangible elements as we've discussed you know things like measures of market penetration sales record um key financials assets liabilities etc again uh, all the points that matthew alluded to uh, the way we look at this is you know we we should be asking questions that's one of the most powerful things. I mean, we do it both in coaching and consulting, but 
you know, the, the sort of questions you should be asking yourself at the due diligence process, and, and because it's, remember, it's, it's a process of discovery, it, it's uh, uh, peeling back layers, you know. Um, now, first of all, and, and a key point, you know, in the cultural element, how often do DDs really look, truthfully look at the human and people element, you know? How often do we put effective transition processes in place? How often in an acquisition do we declare victory too early? You know, these are all critical things. And following on from that, you know, do the teams feel deflated or energized after the deal? You know, how do we get relevant quick wins? How do we keep up momentum and sustain the process? And how do we really change the organizational systems to sustain the gains? Now, that's not an exclusive list by, or even an exhaustive list by any uh, manner at all. But the key thing is you, in my experience, having been part of the acquiring company on the team and also on the receiving company, is it's important that these levels of questioning still take place because that's what's going to do the surfing. If you think about a, an investigation, you know, whether it be a safety incident, even a police investigation, it's all about asking questions. And, and that's very much our thinking and our approach to this. So without, again, going into too much further detail, I'd like to hang over now, which is a, a natural corollary to Matthew, talk about, you know, um, what typically can go wrong, Matthew? Yeah, and I think from, from that list, possibly there's a lot that can go wrong. Um, and I think, uh, in, interestingly, just on that point, I think what, what can go wrong, sort of embedded in, in some of your last points there, I was talking to somebody recently who's got a lot of um, experience from, I'd say, more of a commercial and, and slightly legal background, um, a lot of merger and acquisition experience. And yeah, his, his thinking is that the really hard work around this starts at the point the transaction's done, so everything that follows. Um, I think that's probably because he's, he's quite experienced and quite comfortable with everything that comes before in the due diligence process. But I think your point is, is absolutely right. There's, you know, the, the starting point sets you up for, for the, everything that comes after it. Um, and I think that starting point, as you said, typically, perhaps if not only the focus of um, the scope of due diligence is maybe too narrow, uh, but even if it's slightly broader and covers uh, some of the people and organization elements um, of a transaction or of a business, then the, the DD team may not be sufficiently um, capable, experienced, if you like, of doing that. So, you know, typical to take somebody with good functional expertise and extend their scope, but actually you have to be fairly well equipped and um, have some expertise in looking at the specific subject matter. So you wouldn't necessarily ask your accountant to do the legal DD. Likewise, you, you probably need to make sure your DD team is set up to cover the scope um, of work. And I think having having the, the sort of capabilities of running a, a due diligence process is not really necessarily the same thing as then having some of the skills required to understand, I guess, analyze some of the uh, more intangible information that's provided. And that might be um, partly around how you go about engaging people, but also just understanding, I guess, the position that others take and, and that they're in uh, to be able to make some evaluation of that. You know, the, the person who's selling the business, are they coming with it? And if so, what's their disposition towards that? I think is not something you can necessarily just get through a, a document. Um, I think then beyond that, there's the potential sort of almost the tail end of due diligence and this is possibly going through second to third stage um, of just having a uh, misaligned or potentially diluted sort of idea of what's intended here so the, the goal or the vision of the transaction what are we trying to achieve that that uh, the merger or acquisition is the answer to um, and how do we make sure that everybody involved in it is clear on that both in terms of the data that they're soliciting gathering and, and looking at but also their planning their integration planning and so I think there are times uh, that I've seen and I've been involved in where the, whilst the process of um, integrating post acquisition is there, actually leaders are distracted by other pro priorities, possibly other acquisitions or uh, other critical pieces of business that have sort of been left whilst this uh, acquisition uh, transaction has been going through. Um, teams that might need to be involved um, might again not be scoped properly might not have the right capabilities but also um, likely get dispersed to other things quite quickly so there is this sense of short-termism around you know get, let's get the deal done let's get people 
uh, in uh, and, and integration almost seemingly like a sort of short term process and that people getting dispersed a bit, bit too early. Um, I think the other challenge really that, that we've seen not only in uh, formulating the capabilities and making sure you've got the right focus and aligned kind of prioritization of this. Um, but if it's one of many, I, I, we, we've worked with a client for a while now who's um, almost been on a sort of co constant um, acquisition of, of new uh, organizations coming into the broader company. Um, and I think there is a, the potential that individuals within that process that are also expected to do something else um, are just overloaded with change and overloaded with the, the complexity of every single change being slightly different and having to, to deal with that. Um, so I think there's a myriad of issues there where if not set up correctly and led like any other complex sort of change program, but if this is simply seen as uh, transaction and go, then absolutely it sort of undermines the, the value of the transaction in the first place. It certainly gets in the way of, um, gets in the way of that being successful. So there's, there's quite a lot there, uh, but I think quite a lot, as you said earlier, John, to kind of pay attention in, in the earlier stages and set up correctly, knowing that this is a, a longer term program of work rather than just a, a deal or a transaction. Um, so uh, across all of those things, I think John and I would say we are perfectly placed to, to tackle those problems. We've got a number of years of experience and uh, individually and, and between us um, across a range of things that really aim to uh, address those problems. John, do you want to elaborate somewhat on on what Aspire to Be Lean, Blackmore 4 do in this space that would help um, any organization, any business leader going through this process? Yeah, absolutely. I, I just like to pick up on um, your, your last points. I think um, you, you covered a lot in a very short space of time there in terms of what can go wrong. But the two things that struck in my mind, and I sort of want to plant a seed with people, is one, um, declaring victory too early because of, as you said, team dispersal or people not aligned properly. Is, in my experience, I've seen that on numerous occasions. And the other one that you mentioned um, is what I would call initiative overload, where people get pulled off um, and end up doing other things. So there's competing priorities. I have seen that in loads of situations in all sorts of, um, not just acquisitions, but in change programs as well. So I think those are two key points um, for everybody to remember in this sort of whistle-stop tour, um, you know, in terms of uh, the Aspire to Be Lean and Blackmore 4 view of um, cultural um, integration, shall we say, as part of the M&A acquisition process. So specifically, what can our, um, <clears throat> what can our businesses do to, to help anybody who, who are facing these sort of challenges? Um, there's, there's quite a myriad of things. And I think the first thing we have to say is that um, it isn't a one size fits all. It's a very much an approach where, you know, we, we assess what the needs are by working with the clients and the customers and everything else. But typically, you know, um, the things that we can do are identify and, um, and assess critical capabilities um, to be in the be acquired business. We can assess change readiness. We can design structures and processes for effective integration. Um, we can be involved in program design and management, identify or select change leaders and agents, which is really important, um, develop selection criteria for moving forward, um, and individual and team coaching and sustainability models. I mean, there are plenty of other things. It's impossible to go through an exhaustive list, you know, but also things like KPI selection and processes and personnel and team assessments, uh, both of which we've with the both companies have done before. And we can also advise on the effectiveness of HR processes. And that's just a very, very short summary of the sort of things that we could do to help your business if you are facing these challenge and you thought, you know, we were the right fit. So really uh, at that point, um, I'd just like to say it's very much um, about the principles, um, as I've said earlier on, and I'd like to call on Matthew really just to, to close this very sort of short session. Yeah, thanks, John. I think, um, as you say, trying to trying to cover a lot of ground in a, a short space of time is a complex uh, arena, but um, really appreciate all of your insights into this, John, and hope it's been useful for, for anybody who's listening. I think the, the key message John's getting to there is, you know, for each of the 
the individual aspects of this, um, there's some complexity. There's obviously a longer list of things that need to be considered uh, throughout this process. But if you are in, in any stage of the merger and acquisition process, or at least you're uh, contemplating that as a strategic option, then I think get in, get in touch with um, either, either John, myself, or both, both of us are happy to talk in, in the same place at any time uh, with anybody who wants to go through this in a bit more detail. Uh, and we'd really appreciate that. You'll be able to find our details on our, our respective websites. And as I said, John and I together, um, both happy to talk about this in a lot more detail. So thanks for listening. Uh, look forward to talking to you at some of the time. Thank you. Thank you again, Matthew.